Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Paul Newcomb, uh, who used to be at the Biostatistics Unit, where he was um, on his way to becoming a uh, programme leader. And now he works at, um, at GSK, where he's a director of uh, statistics in uh, Nikki Best's department. So, Paul, please go ahead. Thank you, Sean. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, nice to see um, so many faces that I, I well recognise. I was saying, walking down the corridor just now with Paul Kirk, or Paul. Uh, I was just saying, if I if I shut my eyes and squeeze hard, I can almost imagine the last four years have been a weird dream, <laughs> and I still work here. Um, but over the last uh, four years, I spent a spell at AstraZeneca in what was sort of a precision medicine group. Um, I saw a very similar thing uh, in my time there as what also see in GSK, and that is a um, ah, not working. Oh, that's because you probably have to click on Vera. Yes. Try it again now. Yeah. Thank you. Um, which is a a real increase over the last few years in the application of omics in randomised trials. So um, it's become pretty commonplace, really, at phase two, and also quite a lot at phase three. Um, often going back to historical trials. And this is, of course, a large part driven by falling costs, but also new technologies like O-Link, which allows high throughput determination of, of proteins, uh, really for the first time. And that's that's only been around for you know, four or five years. Uh, one of the common reasons um, for measuring all these things in randomised trials is to try to identify predictors of treatment benefit um, or, or of weaker treatment effect. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for doing this from very obvious pragmatic purposes, like uh, thinking about a, a new trial in a program and, and, uh, and how you might enrich uh, for putative responders. But just increasing basic understanding of mechanism of action has all sorts of benefits, like understanding what went wrong in a trial, um, positioning, your treatment again against competitors, identifying potentially new new ideas of, of complementary targets and so on. Um, so statistically speaking, traditionally, um, and by the way, I'm using here uh, the definition uh, predictive biomarker, the definition that's endorsed by the, the FDA NIH working group. By that I mean a, a baseline biomarker which predicts treatment benefit relative to a comparator. So inherently, that can only be determined using it through a randomized trial. Um, a biomarker which predicts clinical change irrespective of treatment would be referred to as prognostic in this context. Um, statistically speaking, traditionally, this relates to a statistical interaction test. So testing for an interaction between your baseline biomarker <laughs> and um, the effect of treatment on your endpoint. But it's fairly well recognized that doing these tests exhaustively, especially in a high dimensional context, is highly suboptimal. And there's been quite a lot of literature appear in this space, maybe over the last seven or eight years now, where it's, it's pleasing to see this is very clearly uh, recognized. And there's two major reasons for that, I'd say. One is um, multiplicity control applied to many one at a time tests tends to be conservative compared to, for example, thinking about combinations and model selection. Um, and also it's surprisingly easy, I don't actually have any in this talk, but it's surprisingly easy to construct simple examples of nonlinear effects or effects on treatment that genuinely depend upon a combination of variables that would be missed by one at a time testing. And, th and that's not to naively say there'd be no evidence at the individual constituent biomarkers, but they might rank poorly in the context of thousands of tests. Um, so ideally, um, we'd be applying some of the many 
advances in the in the field of high dimensional statistics and machine learning, uh, such as model averaging and non-parametrics. But many of these tools off the shelf have been designed for modeling an endpoint, so an outcome, not modeling a parameter, uh, a treatment effect. Uh, that said, I say over the last, I suppose, seven years or so, um, and there's been um, apparently quite an investment in this space, uh, which is great, and some promising newer methods have emerged, which combine machine learning tools with statistical principles of causal inference. Um, some of them look quite promising, but their performance when applied to lots of variables is largely unknown. And a big reason for that is a lot of these kind of um, data sets are not yet in the public domain. So they're only recently starting to be generated with an industry. It will take some time until they until they're made public. Um, so our initial aim in this project was to try to take some of these off-the-shelf tools um, and consider their utility in a high-dimensional setting, um, the one I've found so far in the literature. So the first task was sifting through the literature. Um, Before before going on, I just want to reiterate that we're because the word prediction can cause confusion. Um, we're interested in here in methods that predict. Uh, by here, I'm defining a predictive biomarker as a biomarker which predicts treatment benefit versus control. So, as I say, it's akin to a statistical interaction problem. Um, there are many off-the-shelf machine learning tools that are directly applicable to model an outcome, but will not apply to this problem of modeling a treatment effect. But as I said, there has been a lot of development. This is, I strongly recommend uh, the review at the top, this by Ilya Lipkovich from 2017, and it's still very relevant today, even though it's seven, seven years old. Um, and I've classified methods according to a scheme he suggests, which I think makes um, makes reasonable sense. So the simple model at the top is a model of an outcome as a function of your baseline biomarkers X and treatment T. And that model is decomposed into the prognostic component, the H of X function. And the treatment effect here is um, Z, and that's a function of biomarkers. So he um, segregates methods into uh, what he calls global outcome modeling methods. So these would attempt to model the entire FX of T, F of X T surface. And many of the methods that we would use day to day would fall under that umbrella. So a simple statistical interaction test would fall under that umbrella if um, if you were naive to the uh, to the existence of any other biomarker other than the one you're testing. Um, so these attempt to model the complete outcome surface and then infer from the fitted model what might mediate treatment effect. Another class of models, um, given that in this space we may only be concerned with estimating the treatment effect function, there are some methods which use a bit of trickery to avoid modeling the entire outcome function and focus their information just on the treatment effect. So he calls those global treatment effect methods. One of the methods I'll talk about later is an example of that. Um, and finally, local modeling methods I won't be talking about today. They'd be a subclass of the, of the treatment effect methods, but um, the, the nature of these methods is they suppose you don't need to estimate the entire treatment effect function. For example, the extremes are, are unlikely to be relevant. So if there was a way to learn what the important bit of the treatment effect function is, you can focus your information there. Um, and there's no algorithms that attempt to do that. Um, so, Arthur, I need to give a big thank, a uh, big shout out to uh, Ash Wheelie, who joined the, the group I sit in um, from the Turing Institute and had prior experience with some of these, these sort of causal machine learning methods. And she was a huge help wading through this lecture, <laughs> trying to understand which of these methods are sort of different versions of a similar sort of tree of methods. Um, and that led us to selecting these three, each of them, um, or at least uh, 
two of them represent a broader type of method, uh, but pragmatically we've just selected a representative. Uh, and I'm very open to the fact we might have missed something, so any, uh, any feedback is obviously very welcome. So I'll tell you a little bit about, I'll describe each of these three methods, um, share this uh, simple simulation study we did, and then share some results from applying some of this to um, a real trial at GSK. Um, so starting with the modified COVID, let's see, this is actually quite old. This came out in 2014 as a JARSA paper. Um, so it's quite uh, it's quite lofty and quite weighty, and um, but the core concept is actually quite simple. Uh, so we've got the standard interaction uh, regression model at the top. So extending this type of model to high dimensional covariates is, and, and there's a nice reference there for saying that that is an unintuitively complicated task. Um, uh, a lot of the issues there is computational. Uh, so I'm talking high dimension here where we'd need some sort of regularization or penalization or model selection. Um, uh, I think actually Mark Vanderveer might be on the um, on the call. So there are some experts working on these sorts of extensions, um, but um, but it's challenging. And this method employs a sort of a trick to avoid needing to do that. And what it does, take the biomarker matrix X and you effectively multiply it by the binary treatment variable. Uh, so a side note would be that treatment here is encoded as one and minus one. I don't find this very intuitive, so I'm not going to attempt to offer an intuition as to why this is the case, but it's pretty simple mathematically to see this, that if you then do a quote unquote standard main effects regression, on this transformed matrix, those effect estimates that you get are asymptotically equal to the interaction effects from the full interaction model. And this is very significant because it means any off-the-shelf statistical learning or machine learning algorithm that has been designed for modeling the relationship between a single outcome variable and predictors can now be employed for this treatment effect, heterogeneity modeling uh, task. And uh, because Tib Sharani is a um, uh, senior author on this paper, it'll come as no surprise that it, in their paper, they combine it with lasso regression. Um, and that's what we've done here. There's no such thing as a free lunch. <laughs> so there's two, there's two issues with this simple result. And that's really what this paper is dedicated to, is, um, it is mitigating these two issues. The first is this only works as back of the envelope result with a perfectly balanced trial. So as many people on treatment as control. Um, and in many settings that would be fine, but there's also many settings that wouldn't be fine. Maybe there was two dosages run in the trial and you've got a one to one to one randomization ratio. And now you want to pull those dosages. So you've got a two to one ratio of treatment versus comparator. Um, but it turns out there's a simple solution. And the proof of this is in the paper. You can use a weighted likelihood where you weight the individual likelihood contributions according to their odds of being on treatment versus comparator. When those odds are equal, this reduces to the standard uh, regression model. And of course, in GL the GLM net implementation of Lasso, you have waiting available, so you can directly carry on with Lasso. Um, but also many other algorithms, such as support vector machines, will easily allow you to specify individual weights. Um, another uh, issue with it, though, is that Although the estimates you get from this model are asymptotically equal to the interaction effects, they aren't as efficient. So in finite data, you won't get to the true interaction estimates as quickly as you would do in principle with the full model. So it turns out we do lose something by sidestepping modeling the prognostic part of the model, the, the effects of the biomarkers just on risk or on the outcome. Um, the um, solution they propose to mitigate that, this doesn't recover full efficiency, but in the paper they show it recovers quite a lot, is um, 
conceptually actually quite simple. You, this becomes a two-stage model where you first learn the model for the outcome. So you just take your lasso model, a model outcome on your predictors. Having learned that, you then essentially regress out the prognostic effect of your outcome. So pragmatically, that just means taking your outcome variable and subtracting the predictions from this first stage prognostic model. Um, by doing so, you remove the component of variability in the outcome that's explained by the prognostic effects. Uh, and, and so you, you recover some of this power for modeling the interaction terms, finding these treatment effect uh, heterogeneity effects. So moving on to the um, second method, um, uh, the, the called causal forests. Um, so this has come from the, the Stamford um, group. Again, this is a uh, lofty, detailed uh, jars of paper, which I, which I would recommend is, is very good. Um, so I'm sure, I'm sure in this room in particular, everybody is familiar with random forests, but just to briefly recap, so there's a simple, regression tree uh, cartoon on the right of the slide here. So the way a regression tree works is you, you try to identify an ordering of your candidate biomarkers and thresholds that will take you down these branches and partition your data into mutually exclusive groups. On these groups, you can then form predictions simply by taking the average outcome value in each of the groups. And it's an algorithm, so it permeates through, um, permutes through different orderings, different thresholds, uh, trying to choose a tree within various constraints of how deep you want to go and so on. Um, the best ex that tries to optimize a simple statistic such as residual variability explained or, or, or um, something like that. So these are. Um, I would say, uh, oh, I'm oh, sorry, I, I forgot to say, this is just a, a single regression tree. These are well established to not be particularly good. Um, they can give you spurious results. They can easily overfit to the data. So it was discovered that if you do this many, many times to repeated bootstraps of your data and build up many, many trees and average over the predictions, this is a so-called random forest. And the performance of random forest is very, very good and actually um, I believe these have won, or variants of the random forest have won many of the machine learning challenges over the last uh, 10 years or so. For something that's conceptually quite simple, they're um, annoyingly good, you could say. Uh, so it would be nice if we can repurpose random forest to the task of uh, treatment effect prediction. And that's exactly what this paper does. Uh, so one of the, um, one of the main um, so one sort of mechanical adaption is going down through the branches of the tree. Uh, you ensure that you have both treated and controlled people going down each branch. So at the end of each branch, you can estimate a treatment effect. And the major contribution of this paper, but there's a lot of theory backing it up, is that the model fit criterion for this regression tree and consequently the forest is you want to maximize the variability in those branch specific treatment effects. And if you and if you think about it intuitively, if you come up with a tree that partitions in the data in such a way to maximize variability and treatment effect, <clears throat> you're explaining with your tree as much variability in treatment effect as possible. So it turns out those two things are equivalent. And actually they have some original work um, on this new uh, criteria. Um, and um, they also build these trees in such, they call it double sampling, it's basically data splitting, um, which uh, just to briefly say allows unbiased estimation of treatment effects. One of the major contributions in the paper, which they point out, apparently it's the first time this has been done for any form of random forest, is they come up with the analytical sampling distribution of the estimates you get from this thing. So you get point estimates and with confidence intervals for each of your individual's predictions. Um, sadly, I can't see how that's useful for the work we're applying this to, why we would want individual level confidence intervals. I would be much more interested in the confidence interval around a treatment effect of, say, a subgroup, 
Um, that's something the authors are apparently working on. Right. Um, so, oh yeah, sorry, just to say out of the box, you don't get um, uh, inference on the on the strength, uh, on the statistical strength of the variables. You just get a sort of variable importance measure, which relates to how often it appears across the trees. Um, so to try to ascribe some sort of formal uh, error control, we just apply this kind of brute force approximate false discovery rate technique, which I'm sure many of you in the room have, have likely used, where you just simply permute your outcome label. So you create many, many data sets where the relationship with outcome is broken, run the algorithm again and again and again and again. So you build up the distribution of your variable important statistics under the null, and then you can compare your results from the real data to those, those null distributions to get approximate um, false discovery rates to figure out how extreme they are. You could you could use this to get approximate p values. So we use it to uh, to infer um, false discovery rate. It's quite a crude way of doing things. So keep in mind this is quite crude. Um, I'll come back to that point. Uh, so the third method um, is uh, called the X learner. Uh, so this is a meta, a so-called meta learner. Um, and it combines the notion of potential outcomes from causal inference with uh, machine learning, um, which sounds quite fancy, but it's really actually, it's really very straightforward how it works. So in step one, in each of your treatment arms, you train a predictive model. And at this point, any learner could be used. Uh, in this paper, they use random forest and BART, but you could use any predictive uh, learner. Once you've built a, um, so if you think about it, each person in the trial has been assigned a treatment, you know their outcome under their assigned treatment, but you don't know their outcome under the treatment which they weren't given. You use the two predictive models trained in step one to impute, project the, uh, the, the hypothetical outcome each patient would have got on the alternative treatment. So now at this point in step two, you have, for each patient, the, their, their real outcome under the treatment they were given and an imputed outcome under the alternative treatment. If you take the difference of those, you have an imputed individualized treatment effect. You've imputed what their person-specific treatment effect would have been. This is now just one number. So we've gone from two outcomes, one observed, one imputed, to one imputed number. So we've now got one number for each patient. And so we're back in sort of standard statistical learning world. So at step three, we then take these imputed treatment effects and regress them on the biomarkers. Uh, so again, at this third step, any off-the-shelf learner can be used. Um, Oh, I'm so sorry, I really meant to put the uh, formula on the side and I, I forgot to. You then bring these pieces together to estimate um, uh, the, the relationship between your imputed treatment effects and the biomarkers. So you, you get a predictive model for treatment effect. Now it is overfitted because you've recycled the data at different stages. Um, and the authors are very open about that. And a, and a big part of the paper is offering a sort of a bootstrap correction for that bias. Um, but even though it's overfitted, um, it's still quite good, which, which I'll show you in a little bit. Uh, so this was just a, a, a very simplistic slide I put together, the various pros and cons. This, so this is at the end of the literature review. I've actually changed uh, some of these. Now, um, the key thing I'd flag there is that causal forest and modified covariate allow you to both predict treatment effects, but also uh, to learn about what features drive those free treat treatment effects, because it has some form of integrated variable selection, whereas this X learner does not. Um, and I should mention, by the way, there's a bunch of methods in this space now of the X learner. You've got the D learner, the R learner, and the DR learner. Um, and I think these latter ones are actually significantly more sophisticated versions of this. They bolt things together in similar ways. There's twists in the way things are bolted together, but there's more theory worked out for some of these latter approaches. 
Um, but so, but I'm representing all of those with this X learner. Um, so now I'm going to show you a very simple simulation study we did looking at looking at these. Um, so I've taken the of course, all three papers. The only paper which looked at something high dimensional was the Tian and Tibshirani modified covariate paper. Uh, we, uh, of course, it's Lasso, but the, the other two papers, they just look at a handful of variables. So I based this on the, the same data generating model used in that paper. Uh, simulate a thousand biomarkers. I was thinking here about O link proteomics, which seeing apply quite a lot. Um, with one of the, the now older, uh, 1536 panel would would measure about one and a half thousand proteins. After QC, you might have about a thousand left. So that's what I was thinking here. Um, and just like in the paper, we attribute a predictive effect, so an interaction to two of those, a prognostic only effect to six, and two of them are given a predictive and a prognostic effect. But there's also an interaction fitted between two of the predictive biomarkers. So we've got a thousand simulated biomarkers, only four are simulated to be truly predictive of treatment effects, and there's a handful of prognostic biomarkers thrown in as well. Um, in the paper, if you scale that to larger sample sizes, it, it turned out the variability exposure was actually very high. So the main thing I've done relative to the paper is brought down the treatment effects to try to explain what I think is a more plausible level of variability. Um, there's still many holes you could poke this. This is an arbitrary simulation study. Please do poke holes in this. I, I would well, very much welcome that. Um, but I was trying to, I mean, there's example of variants that explain about, you know, 15% of the variability in their genes. Some of the trials we have about 10 to 20 percent of variability in the outcome is explained by sort of key factors so that's the sort of variability explained as targeting so i'm not simulating no signal um but i'm trying not to simulate a, a huge signal and i've got everything and that higher order interaction is it in the prognostic effects or the predictive interactions? It's it's one of the predictive only. Oh, sorry, it's between uh, two predictive effects. One of which is predictive only, and one of which is predictive on prognostic. I think I've remembered that correctly. It's definitely between two of the predictive effects, and the all of the terms are equal. I should say. Um, obviously, there's two sets: one for the phase two scenario, one for the phase three scenario. These numbers were based on trials we were thinking about at the time with the GSK. Um, and the way, again, this part was copying the, the TM paper, just to have a sort of a base case starting point. Again, I welcome holes to be poked in this. Um, the effects flip from biomarker to biomarker. So one is positive, then the next one's negative. Um, so there's a 50-50 mixture of directions. And arbitrarily, I but in a 50% correlation. So they're not super correlated, but there's not that correlation. Um, so here's uh, results from the phase two simulation study. Um, so the modified covariate um, sort of did, I think, surprisingly well. So in the phase two settings, so there's four simulated predictive biomarkers here. Um, it tends to pick up two of them, um, so that gives you the 50% true positive rate in the top left um, in the phase two scenario, and it tends to get all of them in the phase three scenario. Now, I suspect what this means is the signal is still too strong, because I would not say that this is realistic. Um, but th th this was a starting point, and I still think this is informative to examine the relative performance. So by contrast, the causal forest um, did not do very well at all at phase two. It starts to pick up some of the signal in the phase three setting. And really the uh, univariate testing with, um, what's that? Oh yeah, F controlled false discovery rate 0.2. So this is just a bunch of univariate interaction tests. Benjamin Hotberg, FDR control, um, actually falls over. It doesn't identify 
anything. And all of the methods on the right seem to have reasonable error control. Um, so moving on to a, a twist on the simulation. So variable selection, performance, um, which is useful uh, in many of the settings we're thinking about, but it's not a it, it, it's not a um, it's not an assessment of their ability to actually predict the street the treatment effect and actually stratify a population of patients into likely responders and non-responders. Um, so here, using all of the same simulation uh, parameters, but just simulate two data sets in each replicate now. Um, one is used to train the models and build a model of uh, treatment effect. That is then used to stratify the second simulated data set, um, just simply at the median. So there's no, uh, which was just a lazy way of sidestepping threshold optimization. So just stratify the second data set uh, into 50% uh, highest predicted treatment effects, 50% lowest predicted treatment effects. So we then have this binary projected treatment effect classification. And then in this second independent simulation, just test the interaction between this binary projected treatment effect and the treatment assignment. Um, so we, so to recap that, we have one data to train these predictors of treatment effect. And then we have a second data set where we stratify on that predicted treatment effect and test the interaction between the stratification and the treatment effect. I think I've made that sound more complicated than it, than it actually is, but it's an independent assessment of the interaction of the signature uh, trained by these models. Um, so to summarize that, in this plot, we've just got on the y-axis the minus log 10 p-value of the interaction test between this projected stratification and treatment in the, the kind of the independent validation trial. Um, so we've now got the X learner on the plot, wasn't previously because it doesn't offer variable selection. Um, so a, a, a sort of unfairly simplistic use of the univariate analysis, um, which was just creating weighted scores. Um, feel a bit unfair doing that. I'm sure that is not what one would do in practice with a thousand variables, um, but that completely fails to replicate. Um, at phase three, all three of these methods, I would actually do very well. Again, I suspect this indicates I've simply simulated too strong a signal, but I still think it's interesting for their relative performance. So all of them are consistently comfortably significant when trying to replicate their, their projected um, treatment effect. The X learner obviously seems to do the best. It's the most consistent. The box plot is the tightest. So it seems to most confidently uh, replicate. Um, and similar at phase two, except the causal forest just doesn't work at phase two. Um, and here, the previous performance could be down to the very crude way I've implemented variable selection with a sort of brute force approximate false discovery rate. This isn't being used there. This is using its genuine predicted treatment effects. This is in line, though, with some of the discussion from the authors. It's not thought to do well with small sample sizes. And these are small sample sizes in the phase two setting. Um, so, yeah, th this is interesting, I thought, because... The X learn, which I've nearly dismissed as not being very useful in practice because it doesn't come with feature selection, um, does actually quite substantially outperform the other two more statistical methods. Also, despite it being um, transparently biased, uh, recycles the data and the way it constructs this predictor, um, but it, it performs very nicely. It just actually made me... Uh, yeah, yeah, we <laughs> we think um, my uh, my view on machine learning is a little bit nice to see this, uh, and that's uh, uh, combining X learner with Bart here. Uh, as I say in the paper, they use random forest and Bart. Bart seems to perform best. Uh, so that was the end of my uh, 
modest little simulation study. If there's any questions on it, they'd be very welcome at this point. Um, otherwise, I'll go on to our application. Okay, so um, uh, so uh, I'm very used to calling it Ben Lister, Bilimumab, which is the mar marketed name of um, GSK's uh, lupus drugs. This was launched in 2011. Um, uh, it targets uh, the bliss or, or back protein, um, which is a protein um, that that promotes survival of B cells, which is an autoimmune cell that can attack the body all over the place, um, leading to all sorts of um, different uh, um, very nasty manifestations of, of what lupus can, can be. Um, so as this is an approved treatment, it's, it's quite old now, there's been multiple phase three trials. In this work, we went back to some of the historic data um, where transcriptomics have been measured recently to try to explore a little bit what, what drives treatment effect heterogeneity. Um, want to be very clear here that only a very, there's five phase three trials now um, for SLE uh, and this drug. Um, each trial was run for a different reason, so they're in different geographical populations, slightly different recruitment criteria and so on, but there are still five phase three trials. So there's thousands of patients available within the company. We have looked at here a handful of several hundred, which is all we have so far applied uh, transcriptomics to. So um, this may well not, everything about show you may well not be representative of, of all uh, below yeah, oh gosh, I can't stand out. Um, uh, all treated patients. Um, so we started, um, so, so, so it started with a, a 58,000, I think, um, uh, transcripts um, from RNA seq. So after, I think, fairly standard uh, QC and just taking the 50% most variable, we had about 3,000 genes to analyze. So we first ran them through um, the standard one at a time univariate interaction testing, and nothing was significant. Um, even with a really liberal um, false discovery rate control of about 50%. The next thing we did, so I'm only going to show you today results from modified covariate lasso. Um, we have also run causal forest, but that wasn't really ready to go. Um, the results are actually quite consistent with this, which is uh, interesting and reassuring. Um, so as I'm sure you'll all know, lasso gives you a binary selection variables are in or out. Um, that wasn't going to be very satisfactory for this project. So we combined it here with something called complementary pair stability selection. So this builds on um, a seminal piece of work that many of you may be familiar with from 2010. Uh, uh, Mindshausen and Bullman uh, proposed stability selection where you uh, take an algorithm like Lasso and repeatedly run it to 50% uh, random samples of your data set. By doing so for a for a hard selection procedure like Lasso, where things are in or out, by repeating it many times to lots of subsets, you build up selection probabilities. And the really nice thing in this um, original Weinstein Bullman paper is they work out analytically if you were to apply different thresholds on these selection probabilities, what what error, uh, what false discovery rate level you would be controlling for. Um, and it's an analytical theoretical result, so of course it comes with assumptions. Um, I'm using here a extension in 2013, or, or an evolution. And um, so this is by uh, uh, Richard uh, Samworth, and Raja Shah at, at Cambridge Stats Lab. And actually, I came across this while I was working at the BSU. We did a bit of work with them, so we uh, we combined this with something we were doing. Um, and it's a very impressive theoretical paper, but they basically build on the mindshouse bullman results um, with uh, some weaker conditions required for the result, and possibly more importantly, it's more powerful. Um, it allows you to detect more signal variables um, for the same, same threshold, uh, for the same error control level. 
Um, I'm going to be a bit lazy on the following just slides and just continue to describe this false discovery rate control. They actually come up with a new, instead of uh, one of their big proposals in this paper, instead of thinking about um, black and white terms of a variable is a true variable or a false variable, they loosen that definition to noise variables and signal variables. And a lot of the theory relies on that loosening definition. So it's not quite right to call this false discovery rate control anymore. It's control of noise variables. Um, but you'll see it described as FDI on the following slide. So apologies for that. And also practically, and I won't go into any more detail now, but it's easier to run in our, um, uh, it takes less loops to run this than, uh, than the original minus thousand Bullman uh, method. Uh, so we, uh, I've anonymized uh, the uh, the gene names. That was a condition of presenting this, but applying um, modified covert lasso, uh, we found five genes uh, that significantly, as inferred by this this procedure, significantly predict um, the benefit of treatment uh, versus placebo. Um, the the nature of those interactions is, is in the bottom right plot, but of course it doesn't mean much without <laughs> gene names. Um, and this is, as I say, control and false discovery rates uh, under CPSS at 10%. So, so I'm not sure, not sure this, but, so you'll have to take my word for this. So it's very nice work um, by colleagues in computational biology. Four out of five of these genes are biologically plausible. Um, which I think is quite remarkable because this is an agnostic, from an agnostic transcriptomic panel. There's many un unannotated um, transcripts that from that, of the five we identify, four make sense. And I know it's often easy to come up with a story, but I still think that's quite uh, quite compelling. Um, one definitely doesn't seem to make any sense at all, but just for a bit of balance. Um, <laughs> So although there are five randomized trials within the company of this treatment, uh, only one has so far had transcriptomics apply, applied. There is another trial, which was a superiority study, so studying the effect of belimumab with rituximab, which is an, an alternative SLE treatment, but there's no comparator placebo arm in that trial. But this is the only other trial where we have transcriptomics available. Um, so I've attempted here what I'm calling a partial validation. We can't validate the true predictive effect of these genes without a placebo arm. Um, but so I should have had a side on this. But the nature of, of um, these effects is that they correlate with response under treatment, and they don't really under placebo. So if we go to an independent set of treated patients, it would be reassuring if we see correlation between baseline values of these genes and clinical response. Um, it wouldn't be validation, but it would be reassuring. So that's why I'm calling partial validation. So we did that. We took the, the four genes forward uh, that seemed plausible. Um, and two of them sort of just about, <laughs> just about significant. They're not, they're not hugely significant. Uh, they certainly don't survive correction for 3000 tests. But in the context of just testing four proposals, uh, they're just about significant. So a, a big question mark now is whether this is um, clinically useful, whether it's useful to have identified these particular genes as potentially related to um, therapeutic response and mechanism of action is a separate question. Um, but whether these are useful for stratification um, it is now an obvious question. So again, using this sort of this sort of validation set of these treated patients from this other um, phase three trial, uh, we looked at the, um, the predictive discriminatory performance of a weighted score of these two that did uh, that were significant versus the primary endpoint. And they, they beat the current best um, clinical predictor, which is SLEDI. This is a, um, 
a disease, a lupus disease severity score that takes information from lots of domains. Um, there's many criticisms that can be levied at it, but it does still seem to often be the best thing we have for predicting clinical response. So we see a bit of a boost um, there. So in the bottom right, um, and this is just a simple idea I had for trying to, trying to explore this. So again, any feedback, any ideas, any holes, feel free. There would be a question if hypothetically we were thinking about um, limiting treatment to, say, patients that have the top 50% values of this gene score. Well, what treatment effect do they get, right? If you can, uh, so this would not be numerically possible, but if you could identify half of your population where the treatment effect is multiplied by 10, that might make sense to do, um, um, both clinically and, and from a business point of view. But if your score, albeit real, can only identify, say, half of patients where the treatment effect is just a little bit bigger, it probably doesn't make sense to deny that treatment to the other half. So on the bottom right, I'm trying to look at that relationship. So the x-axis is the percentage of patients included. Um, the, top, the top is using this two-gene score. Uh, it, it stops at about 40%, because I think going, going beyond that just makes no sense, at least in our, our context. Uh, so it looks like we can select about half of the population where the treatment effect is doubled, is what this looks like. And whether that's useful or not, I, uh, I don't know. I, I suspect probably not, to be honest. Um, as I say, this is a simplistic representation that I've got here. Um, but I think it is very important to think in these terms. So if anybody has better ideas, um, uh, I would be open to that and encourage that. Um, but of course, yeah, whether or not that's useful depends very much on the context. Um, there could be all sorts of uh, interventions we're talking about here, not necessarily clinical randomized interventions. Um, and yeah, so just to just to wrap up. So we were quite surprised by how good the causal machine learning approaches seem to be honest, both in the in the synthetic study um, and in our little proof of concept. Uh, I went into this thinking that the message here might be even if you apply the best methods off the shelf today, we're still pretty doomed in the context of measuring uh, many omics markers in randomized trials. But I think that's not necessarily the case. And one could also imagine some quite sensible pre-filtering from much larger panels than this to get you down to, um, say, the 1,000, where you think you're going to have highest chance of finding something, or the 2,000. Um, so it seems like certainly in a phase three setting, there is some hope there. Uh, which was a, um, I say, it was a bit of a surprise, and I think quite interesting. Um, just reiterating there, the the actual proof of concept is very much subject to change. It's really just shown here as a kind of illustration uh, of the methods. Uh, expansion to more patients is underway, so it'd be interesting to revisit that in a in a larger sample, hopefully later this year. Um, all of these methods can be run in R. Um, two of them have our packages already, and they they run pretty, pretty reliably. Um, the modified covert lasso uh, GLM net is obviously a fantastic implementation of lasso. Uh, you have to write a wrapper script to do the modified covariate part, but it's pretty easy to work that out from the paper. Uh, so going forward, the the simulation study I've just shown you is severely limited. I think a more detailed exploration would be well warranted in this space because there's a lot of methods appearing. And when I looked, I could only really see explorations in, with very low dimensional covariates. So I think there's an open question, how will these perform in high dimensional spaces? Uh, my simulation study definitely doesn't answer that. We've not looked nearly, nearly enough detail at nonlinear uh, relationships, for example. 
Um, though it does get tricky quickly when you start to think about uh, how many, in your high dimensional settings, how many features would be involved in those nonlinear relationships, for example. Um, we're now looking at applying this to a couple of other programs with GSK, so we'll see how that goes. Um, I'd be really interested to explore these newer approaches, D and DR Learner. Um, I've been connected with somebody at the company who used to work on this stuff um, academically, a guy called David Whitney, who some of you may know, he was at um, NSHTM. Um, he's fantastic and he's taught me a lot. So we're hoping to uh, to move to the DR learner sometime soon, where there's a bit more theory worked out than the X learner. And that could also be um, tied with lasso, so allowing some feature selection. Uh, my experience of running these in practice, in projects, is that variable selection is really, really useful. And the papers kind of skirt over that. For example, the, the modified covariate lasso paper, it's lasso, but they only really assess the strength of the interaction of the trained signature with treatment in their validation set. Um, there, there's no comment there on extracting the important features. Uh, causal forest has very little importance, but you know, how do you explain to somebody um, uh, in a more applied domain, okay, is 61%, is that important? Is that meaningful? I don't know. But where do we draw the threshold at telling them these, these are things to follow up, these aren't? Um, so I think that's a big thing that's lacking in this space. Uh, my crude addition of approximate false discovery rate is not a good solution here to causal forest. I think, I forgot to mention at the time, I think that probably explains this poor performance in the simulation setting. Uh, relative to the lasso approach. Um, so maybe maybe major variable selection could be adapted. I think many of you in the room won't, won't be surprised to hear me uh, suggest that. Um, there's, I think there's other exciting stuff that could be done here. There's all sorts of um, relevant information you could take from UK Biobank, especially since we now have proteomic results there. Um, and um, I was sort of alluding to that all, all earlier, but there is some literature, companion literature in the causal forest space, um, which Ashweedy in our group is, is looking at implementing, which can extract some uh, more meaningful inference than what you get out of the box. That's something we're looking at at the moment. Um, and a big uh, open but very challenging question is power analysis in this setting. Um, I, mean, I think it would have to be done numerically, um, but there's often not a strong understanding of what the power actually is in these settings. Um, and I think we as statisticians could help there, but it's really challenging, I think, to do that in a balanced way. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the answer is there. Uh, and yeah, I'll finish there. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, people on online, they can uh, uh, type into the chat that they would like to ask a question, and then I'll ask you to unmute. But uh, within the room first, John. Can you remind me what the endpoint was in the list of this? Because I thought it was some variant of sled high score. Yeah. Yeah. So, in, in which case, how can you use sled high score as a as a predictor of response, right? Because that's a score. That, so the, the the endpoint is difference in that. So like changing that. Yeah. But they can't improve. There, I, I know there are people in this study, and it was impossible for them to improve under the criteria that was used because of where they started. So I don't see how you can use that as a. And, and doesn't it also imply that if some of the some of the transcriptomics is predicted with some of the elements of that score? even at baseline, you're going to get a, a relationship between possible treatment effects and, and those those transcriptomic measurements. Yeah. Uh, no, very good questions. Just trying to think how to... Um, um, so they have a paper, and uh, it's definitely in the public domain, this, there's a conference um, abstract, uh, sorry, conference poster, and I think this is in their paper, um, 
But you're right that the primary endpoint is one year change in sleep time. So yeah. one year change in disease severity. But one of the strongest sort of subgroup effects is baseline sleep time, binarized. So the more severe patients seem to have the largest drop. Um, but isn't that just an artifact of like where you start and where you can possibly go to? It's like there's a whole bunch of people with who start low and can't can't get any lower basically. But it, it's um, it, it, it's significant. Well, I haven't said that I haven't found this significant as an interaction, but that's what the interaction test would answer, wouldn't it? Because uh, that would yeah. that would ask: Is there a difference in that relationship between the treatment arms? So, irrespective of a treatment, yeah, I agree there will be a strong relationship, but that relationship can still differ depending on treatment. And but again, to reiterate, that's not what came out in our model. We adjust for it because it's one of the um, key stratification factors. And also, sorry to clarify on this, and I, I think I've yeah, it, it's there's also I think a something that is confusing in my size because in this sort of partial validation, that's all treated patients. So that did, sorry, that is actually directly relevant to your question. So in those all treated patients, sleed eye does seem to be baseline sleed eye. Yeah, is predictive of sleed eye change, and I guess you'll say that's kind of obvious. It has to be, yeah, yeah, by construction. Yes, you're. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, um, so we have a question from Mark van der van der Leeuw. <laughs> Hi, thanks, Paul. Really inspiring. Uh, I was wondering whether you tried um, the horseshoe plus the decoupling shrinkage and selection for variable selection. Because in my experience, it can be quite competitive to lasso and stability selection, uh, both in performance and computation. Uh, no, we have not, Mark, but thank you for that. And I, uh, I would love to follow up with you about that. Okay, good. Uh, Mark is the expert in this in this space, I should say. Amanda, oops, uh, we have a question from uh, Lira Piri about uh, P. Look, I'm sorry, I'm not sure how you pronounce your name. Um, could you unmute uh, and ask your question? Uh, hello, this is I wondering if you try the classification um, question as well. So I wonder if how you can tackle those challenge of imbalance on this response variable. So do you have any experience or do you have any suggestion on that imbalance design on the response variable? Um, I don't have any useful uh, comment I'm afraid, but it's a good yeah, it's a good point. I wonder if you might be getting at you can just get unlucky that you get unbalanced response rates between the arms that can cause all sorts of issues um but i i can't suggest any smart solutions i'm afraid okay and uh i thank you i have second question can i ask now yes yes or other because so many questions on the li on the way list so yeah from your secret slide um, did you use some biology like bioinformatics inference tool like Goldturn, IMAC, et cetera? Do you have any specific software if you did, which you prefer to kind of compare your statistical results to biologically? Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so the tools we use are these kind of statistical packages, the, the, um, the causal forest and, uh, and lasso. And um, and the X learner, um, I would be looking at thinking about more bioinformatic tools, things like MOFA and some of the really nice uh, sort of evolutions of factor analysis that you see percolating in this space. Um, but there is a key difference there is that those methods don't directly model the link between baseline biomarkers and efficacy. That's the sort of that's the USP really of this niche of and I just saw my first slide. There's a bunch of these methods now that directly model that relationship, um, but it, it's not to say it's the only way to discover useful subgroups. Um, you might learn a pattern at baseline using something like MoFa, and it turns out that that 
subgroup has enhanced treatment effects. I, I wonder if the question is more for your secret slide. How did you decide those four out of the four out of five genes are biologically relevant? Um, I. I don't know that I was about to say just Google, but I was doing a little bit of a discussion. <laughs> <laughs> but with a very smart operator of Google. Uh, but yeah, reading, re looking, looking at the literature. Okay. okay. Uh, so, uh, Gilbert, would you like to um, ask your question? Gilbert? Yes, I'm here. Sorry, I, I forgot again to uh, unmute. It's sometime since I worked on the last soon, I was very interested uh, on uh, this uh, uh, methodology. And the question I wanted to ask was, does this uh, transformed covariate method dispense with all the non-hierarchical modeling problems associated with the uh, fitting interactions in the last suit, as usually in, in uh, that case, you end up with non-hierarchical models in the uh, in the in sense of <coughs> of Nelder. This leads to invariant uh, to a lack of invariance in the likelihood and in the estimates. Uh, so I was wondering. Uh, uh, are we free from that? And uh, uh, to, to check out uh, this uh, th this idea and to check, I wonder what happens when you change the coding of your predictors. I noted that you were using Yates' uh, method in the for the binary variables. Um, so to, to the first question about, um, I'm not I'm not really sure. I, I mean that the I, I guess you're getting at the hierarchical connection between in a standard um standard application. So if you were attempting to use regular regression using the standard form of an interaction model, you might want to honor that if you bring in an interaction term, you should bring in the corresponding main effects. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Uh, and if you don't. Uh, you you end up with models which uh, whose estimates uh, you end up with models in which the likelihood is not not invariant. So that, for example, if you don't do that and you change the coding of your your x variables, you don't get the same results. So the main, I don't think I have a good answer. I would encourage looking at the paper because there is a discussion about this. Um, they argue in the paper that if you are concerned solely with predicting treatment effect, it's only the interaction term that you're interested in. So to answer the original question, yes, it does sidestep the computational problem of having to honor this hierarchy because it, it enables you to target directly the interaction terms. But there is this whole efficiency loss. And I wonder if this um, relates to what you're raising. And then the authors do discuss that. That's why they have this, um, this efficiency augmentation um, suggestion, which doesn't recover full efficiency. It attempts to mitigate it. Um, but there is definitely an efficiency loss, um, but apparently not a bias if you, if you do sidestep modeling the, the kind of the, the hierarchically constituent main effects. From the simulation, do you have some idea about the uh, uh, how uh, how soon the uh, the results uh, uh, kick in? Uh, how big must the sample size be? I mean, it's an asymptotic result, and I was interested uh, to know how good uh, how good the result is. I don't. Um... But I'd encourage it. But I mean, one of the issues is what would you compare against? Because you'd you'd need some way of modeling the full interaction model in high dimension. Yeah. And that's the and that's the problem. Um, and I think there is literature showing that this is considerably more efficient than something like the group lasso, which tries to penalize these groups of 
uh, main effects and interactions where um <coughs> sorry that's not much of an answer <coughs> Still, it's still, uh, it's good to know uh, where, as I mentioned at the beginning, sometimes I worked on it. So it's, it's very good for you to tell, to update me on really where, where the subject is at present. Thank you very much. Okay, now at this point, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to end the meeting, uh, end the, the seminar. There are a few questions in the room. Um, you're welcome to hang around and ask your questions. I've got a question myself. <laughs> so I shall be hanging around, but uh, thank you very much to the online audience. Oh, well, one last round of applause for.